Well, hello everyone. I hope you're having a great day today. Welcome to Monday's edition of Take 5. Now, last week we did a series entitled In Defense of the Rapture, where we're gathered to Christ. This week we're talking about In Defense of the Gathering Church, where we will be biblically basing our foundation for our belief in gathering locally at the local church and coming together and having the worship services that we still have today. So many are pushing that aside and saying that's things that's unnecessary. As a matter of fact, the list of reasons for which Christians neglect to assemble themselves for public worship is long, and it's constantly getting longer with more ideas and excuses that people keep coming up with. But at the same time, the list of reasons that we should assemble, biblically speaking, is also long as well. And that's something that we really could spend weeks and weeks talking about, and we can't do that. We're just going to do that for this one week. But the Bible's very clear. We need to assemble together in faith. It is something that God intends for us to do. I want to try to clear the air about some things, make sure we understand some things, make sure that we are aware that the reason that we assemble is to come together to worship and to serve and to be equipped and to be empowered to be the church that God's called us to be. Coming to church won't save us. Coming to church won't assure us a spot in heaven. It won't do any of those type of things. Jesus did all that. Faith in him and his precious blood is what did all of that. But we do need to understand God expects us to gather. There's a reason behind it. God invented, he created the church, and he did it for a reason. And we need to understand this as best we can. Now, each year approximately 2.7 million people in America cease to be an active church member. So this is something that is declining at a very rapid rate. With Christians steadily departing the church, either by death, and you can't avoid that because generations pass on, or by those that just simply do not attend, churches are steadily disappearing and we can see that in our area. You don't have to look very far. You can see that in our community. According to the United States Census Bureau, more than 4,000 churches close a year. But it's happening because of the disinterest of people. One of the greatest tragedies, tragedies I believe, in the 21st century in America is the realism that millions and millions of people who claim to know Jesus Christ rarely attend a local church or participate in worship services, and, and most of them think it's unnecessary. Yet if you were to go back to the first century and look at the New Testament church, if a, a, a believer in Jesus Christ were to continually and deliberately miss the assembling together of the saints, it was assumed that this person was no longer following Christ. As a matter of fact, they would assume that this person had gone back into the world and, and was no longer a part of the local church simply because they were not coming. They weren't participating in the day-to-day -day life of the local assembly. Now, I do realize this is not the first century. This is the 21st century. I realize that things have changed and times are different. I realize that people have busy schedules that are filled with activities that are demanding our time and we have this constant, ever-expanding array of social media and internet ministries out there. And because we have that, many people feel like that the church, the local church, has become irrelevant and insignificant. And you can often hear the comment being made, I can be just as good a Christian without the church because I have church in my house. Well, this is one of those things that I believe has arisen from a misinterpretation of the scriptures that refer to house churches from time to time. And I personally believe that Satan is muddying the water uh, because it promotes his agenda in depleting this commanded gathering of believers because so much is accomplished when believers come together for worship and prayer and preaching and teaching and giving and serving one another. He knows this happens, and so he's going to muddy the water as much as he can. Let me tell you real quick what the Bible says about house churches to make sure you understand. If you look at Acts chapter 12, you'll find where Mary, the mother of John Mark, let believers use her house 
uh, for a church. Acts 16, the church at Philippi began with a group of ladies who met by the river for prayer on the Sabbath and then also at Lydia's house. Romans 16, Paul said that Priscilla and Aquila had risked their own life for him and allowed a church to be started in their house. And their house church is mentioned again later in 1 Corinthians 16. In Colossians, that passage states that the church in Laodicea was probably started in the house of Nymphus. And then Philemon, Paul wrote to Philemon and Aphia and the church that met at their house. So, so these house churches existed during the first century. You can read about them, but it did primarily because of persecution that the first century church endured through the Gentiles and also through the Orthodox Jews because it was dangerous to be a Christian, a Christ follower during that time and for many centuries following that. So that's the first reason they did it is, is because it was dangerous and they did it because of persecution. The second reason they did this was because that's how most of them started. That's how they began. Most of them had very humble beginnings with just a few souls that had been led to Christ through the missionary work of the first church that began in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And so they met in houses and some even outdoors until they could find some, you know, better form of a more permanent structure. And, and that's really no different than the way churches are planted today. When we plant churches, that's the first thing we look for is a vacant building in a shopping center or will a school allow us to use their gymnasium or, or something of that nature. And, and so that's really no different. You have to have some place to start, but it's just a place to start until you can get something more permanent. It's kind of like the way this church started. It didn't start in a house, but it did start in Gilmore's old store. And then when they outgrew that, it moved to the old Wallace School until finally some land was donated, ground was broken, this church was placed where it is today. All of that was just in an effort to get to a place where you could have a more permanent structure where people could gather together. The design behind the house church was not so that every home can have their own little church and do their own little thing and not be involved in the body and in the life of the local church. That was never the intent. That's a misinterpretation of scripture. It is Satan muddying the waters and we need to understand what the Bible says about it. And tomorrow we're going to take the time to look at how the Bible also teaches us about the establishment of the the local church, and we're going to try to gain some truth and understand why it is so needful that we gather together. Hey, this week, this is in defense of the gathering church, and we're going to do everything that we can to try to help us understand that God intends for us to gather together so the work of the kingdom can move forward. Hey, it's been good being with you today. I look forward to being with you tomorrow on Tuesday's edition of Take 5. Till then, God bless you. Have a great day. Hey, trust the Lord my friend, he will never fail you.